thanks very much. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, so at the beginning of the adolescent session earlier today, uh, Judge Barker said, listed off some of the examples of things that we know about adolescents. Uh, they're impulsive, they're susceptible to peer influence. And then she asked this question. She said, yes, but, but is it a defense? And this same issue arises about addiction. We can examine addicts. We can learn a lot about them. We can learn a lot about their behavior. We can learn a lot about their brains. Um, but then we have the question, is it a defense? And one of the things that um, we're trying to undertake in the MacArthur Foundation project is to try to use neuroscience to investigate that question, whether or not addiction is a defense. So what we're particularly, so I, as I see it, I wrote the central, maybe that's exaggerated, but a central question for the criminal law when it comes to addiction is how does justice require us to respond to crimes by addicts? Are they ameliorated in their responsibility in some way or another for the crimes that they commit or not? And if so, why? Now, the hope is that neuroscience could inform our answer to that question. Um, we all have our hunches about what the answer is going to be, but let's try and develop some evidence for what the answer is. So what you find in kind of public discourse about addiction, I think this will probably be familiar to you, you find two extreme positions sort of filling up the op-ed pages when people write about, about addiction. So you find one group of people who say, look, this is about personal responsibility. If an addict breaks into my car and steals my laptop, in what sense should I be thinking, oh, it's OK, he's an addict? No, I should be thinking he should be held responsible for that. He has wronged me. He has violated a legally protected interest of mine. And the thought is, what? why did he do it? He did it because he cared more about getting high than he cared about me. More about that than about me. He had bad social preferences of a certain kind. Now, sure, addicts as a group, according to this sort of model, have those kinds of preferences. That doesn't count in their favor. It counts against them. An alternative model, and I Actually, I don't think Wilson would necessarily say all, accept all of the, what are commonly accepted as the implications of this in certain kinds of op-ed pages. But, but often, this, the slogan that's gone along with this alternative is to say, no, no, addiction is a disease. And it's to paint all the bad behavior of the addict as symptom, as no different fundamentally from, for instance, the symptoms of a heart disease or the symptoms of a bone problem, um, where we should be saying of the addict who breaks into my car, we should be saying the same thing about him as we would say about somebody who walks slowly to save somebody else, but, oh, he had a limp, right? No, it's not their fault. It's just a disease. Now, my, my personal view about this is that neither of these models captures the truth of the matter. I would say, for instance, about the personal responsibility model, there is no question that, at least from the point of view of addicts, they recognize themselves, they conceive of themselves as very much under the control of something other to them, external to them. To just ignore that is to ignore a lot. Um, on the flip side, to say that addiction is a disease begs a lot of questions rather than solving them. In particular, it doesn't tell us whether among the symptoms of that disease are fully responsible behavior for which people deserve punishment. Call it a symptom if you like, but it doesn't mean that magic word symptom doesn't mean that this isn't something for which people should be held responsible. Maybe this is a disease that has symptoms which are criminally responsible behavior. That's the symptom of the disease. So, but look, which direction, and actually I think it's interesting to know kind of which as an intuitive matter, some people are drawn to one of these kinds of views, some people are drawn to the other. Um, who knows why, really? Let's see if we can get some evidence about it. So here's a way of starting to think about this. Maybe what we should be thinking about is what impact addiction has on facts that we already, and for independent moral and legal reasons, recognize to make a difference to responsibility. OK? 
Okay. So one obvious thing is control. Are addicts diminished in their control? Is addiction, we might say, option limiting? Does it cut down on what kinds of courses of conduct are genuinely available to addicts? Do they have fewer courses of conduct available to them as a result of being addicts? Maybe so. It, it, to try to oper operationalize that notion of control in a way which allows it to be investigated in the lab is exceedingly difficult. What about something else? What about mental state? Maybe addiction is mind altering. Maybe it doesn't close your options, but it changes the way in which you're thinking when you act. And maybe it does so in some way which diminishes your responsibility or aggravates your responsibility. In any event, what's, what actually is the impact of addiction on the mental state of people who are engaging in bad behavior? Now, we already have a body of law that recognizes ways in which differences in mental state make a difference to responsibility. Laws about mens rea is one particular case. So we grade crimes under model penal code categories, for instance, model penal code mens rea categories, more severe if done intentionally, if the harm is done intentionally, less severe if the harm is brought about recklessly or negligently, for instance. Um, similarly, mental states, as defined under the law, make a difference to sentencing. We often see the mental state of the defendant as a mitigating factor, or sometimes as an aggravating factor for sentencing purposes. So in the example in the, um, I've forgotten the name of the defendant in the uh, sample case in your, in the um, book to, for today. Roman Deere. Yes, thank you. Um, one thing that looks like an aggravating factor in his case is that he pistol whips a victim, he pistol whips a victim as opposed to hitting a victim with, say, a pipe. And it looks like in hitting the victim with a pistol, he's increasing the likelihood of killing that victim since there's some chance that that gun is going to go off. And if you thought, as a judge, and I think he was consciously aware of the risks that he was going to kill this person when he hit him over the head, that's going to aggravate your sentence. Um, or if you thought, actually, he was oblivious to that risk, the, the actual risk may still aggravate, but the obliviousness would seem to count in some way in his favor. So that kind of mental state distinction is going to look like it makes a difference to, to sentencing in the same way, or in similar ways anyway, to the way it makes a difference to what crime you're guilty of is when crimes are graded by mens rea. So here's a question. Could we use neuroscience to help us understand what the impact of addiction is on mens rea? So for instance, so take two defendants, both of whom pistol whip the victim before they steal his money, one of whom's addicted and one of whom's not, one of whom's withdrawing, as Roman Deere was, one of whom's not. And here you are, and you're trying to decide, is this person more or less likely to have been aware of the risks of killing another person when he did this? Does addiction even make a difference to that question? Same behavior, a difference in one of them suffers from a certain kind of brain problem, addiction, the other doesn't. But what is that? does that brain problem make a difference to their mental state? Does it alter their mental state in a way that matters? So, now... One reason that you might think neuroscience in particular could be useful to making progress on this kind of question is that it's quite common for people to engage in similar behavior while in different brain states. So if we could find a way of distinguishing, of mapping brain state to mens rea category, then we might be able to make some progress on understanding whether or not addiction, and not just addiction, lots of other mental disorders, whether they make a difference to mens rea and how. So, so one of the subgroups in the MacArthur group has made it its immediate goal to try to classify mental states of subjects in lab conditions in accordance with model penal code categories just on the basis of their brain data. Can we figure out, just by measuring their brains, whether they're in a state that, the model, that would be classified under the model penal code as knowledge as opposed to recklessness, for instance? And we make the knowledge recklessness distinction just on the basis of brain data. Now, a longer term goal of this is to use such classificatory tools to try to figure out what the impact of mental disorders are, including addiction, but, not, but others too. PTSD is high on my list of ones to examine. That to see what the impact is of addiction or of other mental disorders on these kinds of mens rea categories. Put people in lab conditions where we can determine on the basis of their brain data what kind of mental state they're in and see how that's modulated, how that alters, 
when they belong to a particular group, when they suffer from a particular disorder. OK, so I wanted to just now really quickly, super quick, describe, uh, just give you a kind of taste of the kind of experiment we're up to here. Um, this, these obscure signs will make, will make sense in a second. So here's a line of, a line of experiment in which we're engaged. Um, we bring subjects into the lab. We ask them, we tell them the following story. We tell them, look, you're working as a courier. Um, the organization for which you work brings contraband across a border. And the way they do this is that they give a group of couriers suitcases. Each, each, each courier gets a suitcase. One of the suitcases has contraband in it. The others are empty. You don't know whether you're getting the empty one or the one with contraband in it. We are going to vary how many couriers your, with the size of the courier group. Are there five of you? Are there three of you? Are there two of you? Are there one of you? And in so doing, we're going to be varying the probability that you're carrying contraband. The other side of it is that, and that's what's represented, going to be represented by this. In this case, this would be representing to the subject, you're one of five couriers. So you have a one in five chance of carrying contraband. The other thing that you might want to know is that there's a particular probability that you're going to be searched at the border. In this case, there's an 8 out of a 10 chance that you're going to be searched at the border. Okay, And here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to present you with these two probabilities, and we're going to make, give you a choice. Cross the border carrying the case or don't. Okay, And we have a payoff schedule for you. Turns out, not surprisingly, cross the border carrying contraband, get caught, big penalty. Across the border, carrying contraband, don't get caught, big reward. Okay, And the other outcomes also have penalties and rewards associated with them. And these are real penalties. Subjects walk out of this experiment with, with money or with very little money. Um, we've experimented with the idea of using alternative forms of penalty. Um, if anyone's interested, we can talk about how the, that might work. So the course of the, so what, so this is what the, what the subjects see. They see, First, a representation of a particular probability of, the, of apprehension. So in this case, a pretty high probability of apprehension, a lower probability of apprehension. There's a little break. Then they see the probability that they're carrying contraband. In this case, 1 in 5 probability. In this case, 100%. And then they're asked to make a decision. Do you want to carry or not? Okay. This is one version of the experiment. We've got, we're doing this with various forms of stimuli. And meanwhile, they're being scanned with fMRI. So, what, so these ones marked in red here, the brain activity, when they're presented with these two pieces of information, um, is crucial towards classifying, in this case, the, dif the difference between being reckless as to whether or not you're carrying contraband or being in the state of knowledge that you're carrying contraband. And here's what our hope is. We could. It actually turns out to be exceedingly easy using these stimuli to distinguish these on the basis of brain data, but that's another story. What, what our hope is, can we find really significant brain differences that would allow us to predict from, the, from looking at the brain whether the person is in the state of recklessness that's characterized by looking at this, or in the state of knowledge that's characterized by looking at that, or not. And then, if we were able to develop such tools to then examine what the impact of various mental disorders, including addiction, is on mens rea. Um, yeah. So in the current, as we're currently doing the experiment, no. Um, so we're trying to avoid certain kinds of associations with drugs or with other kinds of contraband that may be influencing a lot of things that we're, we're going to get signals that are not the signals that are representative of the particular probabilities in question that we're after. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so these are all factors that we are. These are all factors that we're experimenting with. So, I don't mean to. I don't want you to suggest that. I don't want to suggest that the cover story, as I just described to you, is the only cover story we're using. So, we're describing various kinds of re closely related scenarios in which the in which the decision making task is functionally the same, but framed in different ways for different subjects. And we're using various forms of stimuli in terms of representation of probability and other other factors here. I'm just trying to give kind of a 
tip of the iceberg here of the line of research in which we're engaged. Yeah. Was, was there any um, subliminal message being sent with the color of the briefcase? They look like gold bars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the gold bar interpretation actually is not one that had been discussed. Okay. So one thing about the about an, you, one thing you learn about an experiment like this is that you get really different brain activity when you're looking at five things on a screen in an array like that than you get when you're looking at one, even if you're not, even if you're not thinking of them as suitcases versus <laughs> versus gold bars versus anything. So one of the very hard things to do is to try to equalize stimuli so that you don't you're not simply getting differences in visual differences that are explaining the differences in brain activity. Um, let me end there since I think I'm out of time.